Well, as I shared last night, we're, we're doing something, we're taking a topic and we've actually divided it in two. And as I shared last night, if there's one, if I could have a, a group of people just for one, one session, this is a session that I would invite you to, to participate in. Friday night we began by just sharing how one of the predictions of Jesus, the gospel going into the whole world, is being fulfilled in incredible ways. Saturday morning we spent some time coming to realization that the character of God has been assassinated here in around the world. A character that is totally misunderstood. This character of love is not revealed in, in many denominations as they describe God. This God of vengeance, this God of judgment, this God who can't wait to catch you doing something wrong and blow you away. And that's not what the Bible says. And everything we share in these meetings, this is not what Jody says or what Pastor Alvin or the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Then last night we began to look at some of the most incredible discoveries of artifacts, of archaeological digs. So we looked at the Rosetta Stone. We looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls. We looked at uh, uh, Tel um, Marduk there in, in uh, Syria. Unearthed thousands and thousands of scrolls that have validated. And for, for many, many, many years, historians doubted some of the cities and some of the occasions that are described in the Old Testament. Sure enough, there they are in historical writings. So the Bible has been validated over and over again. Well, tonight, the reality is what we discovered last night about the heart of God. And that should understand what we are, what our intention is this week is to try to understand the heart of God and discover what his plan is for us. What we discovered last night is God does not want us to live in uncertainty. He, doesn't want to, he, want to, he does not want us to be surprised. He wants us to know the future. And he, instead of knowing the future, instead of being afraid, to face the future with certainty, with confidence and assurance, and assurance that it, that despite all of the craziness and the troubles they face in this world, he has a final plan for every human being. I praise God for that. Amen. My brother Lonnie, one of his favorite quotes, he's shared it a couple of times. I'll share it again tonight, and you're going to understand that this quote fits exactly front and center into what we're going to be talking about, that we, might, we may not know what the future holds, but what? We know who holds the future. Now, there's a song. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I mean, friends, that's why so many of these songs that the church has written has given us courage, given us strength. Right now, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, tonight, we are again going to open your word. Just pray that your spirit will be here to give us understanding open our hearts to come to realization that we we fall in love with this heart of God that loves us so much he wants to make it really clear he doesn't want any surprises he wants us to know what the future what's in the future and for us to be prepared so tonight thank you for the wonderful group here bless our efforts now we pray amen Book of Daniel. It's a very, very interesting book to read. A lot of symbols and so forth. But in the second chapter of the book of Daniel, we read a remarkable story. The city of Babylon back then was the most powerful kingdom in the world. And its king, big long name, King Nebuchadnezzar, one night he gets, he has a dream that troubles him. It's a very disturbing dream. And when he wakes up, he cannot remember what this dream was. He can't even remember one detail of it. And he wakes up from this fitful sleep, very, very perplexed. 
But he knew that this dream had some significance. It, had some very, it was very important, but he couldn't remember it. And if you're anything about Babylon, that era, all the kings, they had wise men and soothsayers and fortune tellers and magicians surrounding them. But despite the early hour, he calls forth, he summons his royal counselors, these astrologers, these magicians, these wise men, these sorcerers. And the king asks them a question. He asks of them something that had never, ever been asked by any king ever that ever existed. What he asks me, he says, I want you to tell me what I dreamed and what it means. Uh, O king, uh, if you tell us the dream, we can give you the interpretation. But you want us to tell you your dream? And so here these self-proclaimed wise men, they always claim to, to have this connection with God. So this was a fair question for King Nebuchadnezzar. This is a fair request. Needless to say, these wise men were shocked. These wise guys. They had no way of knowing the dream. This was a totally unreasonable request. And I don't know how they, they got around that with the king, but they probably said, King, um, well, here's what it says. Daniel 2, the Chaldeans, that's these wise guys, answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, we do have to give King Nebuchadnezzar credit for getting one thing correct. Only the gods, only God. But King Nebuchadnezzar was in no mood for arguing. And he was so furious. He was a man with so much power. He was such a vicious ruler that he immediately he issued a decree for all the wise men, all these wise guys, the, the magicians, the astrologers, all of them were going to be executed immediately. Now, it so happened that there were several Hebrew young men who had been taken captivity many years before, who had been taken by force, but by God's blessing, they were now numbered among the king's wise men. They now were that elite group. Now you could go into details as how they got there, but that's, that's not the point of what I, where I want to go. And so the first time these Hebrew young, these young men, the first time they hear of this mysterious dream is when they get the word that they're going to get ready to be killed, that they're going to be taken out being executed. Just to show how God had set, had put Daniel in a place for such a time as this. Amen. Daniel asked the king for time to pray and to ask his God for answers. And guess what? The king knew of Daniel's worth. And because Daniel had earned his respect, because he had earned his respect because of his faithful service, Nebuchadnezzar grants his request. Well, I can guarantee you the rest of those magicians and sorcerers and wise men and whoever else they might, might have been, I bet you they went up to Daniel and they were hugging and thanking him. Thank you, Daniel. That very night, while Daniel is sleeping, God reveals not only the dream, but the secret and the interpretation of the dream. And so God uses this opportunity to display himself, to reveal himself to the pagans in Babylon. Now, my friends, I... I just want to throw something at you here. It's one thing to write history. Now, I know we live in a culture now where we have a whole bunch of people who want to rewrite history. 
They don't like the way history happens, so they want to make it fit their narrative. But that's another story for another time. But to know what, know what, and to write history after it happens is one thing. But to know and write history before it happens is evidence that he is God. That he is God. And that his word is true. And that is exactly what happens here. The book of Isaiah 46 says, For I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Declaring what? The end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are what? Not yet done. Whoa. That are not yet done. So as the story continues... Nebuchadnezzar, again Daniel comes in, he has a session with the king, and the king sits there in amazement to hear the details of the dream. Yeah, he, yeah, Daniel, yeah, that, that's what I saw. Yeah, uh, wow, yeah, that's it. I saw that too. And so the king, after Daniel reveals this dream from front to back, from beginning to end, the king then asks the most logical question. What do you think that question is? All right, Daniel, you've given me the dream. What does it mean? What's the meaning? Praise God. God revealed that to Daniel also. And in just a few words and in a few pictures or images, God sketches the main course of world history from that point to the end of time. So he tells the king, he says, this great image you saw, O king, you are this head of gold. Ooh, I'm important. I'm the most important part of this, of, this, of this statue. And you know, historians actually confirm that gold was a very fitting symbol for Babylon. Many of the extravagant buildings were covered in layers of gold. Even some of the streets were, were, were paved with gold plating. Amazing. Uh, the wealth and the, and the glamour of that city were just unbelievable. So Daniel, Daniel then humbly declares, but king after you, another kingdom shall arise that is inferior to yours. Okay? And history shows us that yes, Babylon fell. Another kingdom would take Babylon's place. And in fact, God had already prophesied exactly how. We read, and, and this prophecy that was, was, was written was made 150 years before Babylon fell. God even told, God even told who, who and how it would happen. He named the conqueror. His name was Cyrus the Mede. His name was given in a prophecy 150 years before he was even born. But we look back, to secular, back in secular history and we can verify it. Here's what it says in the book of Isaiah 45, which is written, like I say, 150 years before Babylon fell. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. Now, I don't know how much history some of you uh, I know there are history buffs. There are people that don't really enjoy history much. I wish I was one of those people that could read historical documents, remember dates and times and events, but there are certain things that stick in my mind. But God said that the king's government was going to be overthrown, that Nebuchadnezzar would cease being the king of Babylon, and another nation would take over, and it happened just like God had said it would happen. And it happened to Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. 
On October 13, 539 B.C., the golden kingdom of Babylon ended just as the prophecies had predicted. Amazing. Now, when it talks about those gates being opened, historians tell us that there were these double gates that were in the riverbed of the Euphrates River where Babylon was built. And these gates were, were, were secure. This, is, this kept the city from being besieged or being entered into without permission. And uh, in a drunken state, the soldiers and those who were assigned to that, those gates had left it open. And the army marched through that riverbed of the Euphrates into the city of Babylon and overthrew it. Wow. Now let's move on. So the nation that overthrew Babylon, represented by that silver section of that statue, were the nations of Media and Persia, the Medes and the Persi Persians, and they ruled the Middle East for 200 years. They were a strong, strong nation. And so now we look at the next prediction that God gave Daniel that came true as well. It says, and then another, a third kingdom, kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So now we have this bronze part of the image. And this prediction was fulfilled exactly by a brilliant young general. And I'll bet you many of you know who he was. You may recognize that name from your world history class. His name was Alexander the Great of Greece. Alexander the Great was probably one of the greatest generals, one of the greatest strategists known to mankind. And he, and he defeated Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Arbella in 331 B.C. Sadly, Alexander the Great died before his 33rd birthday of intoxication of alcohol. He was a drunken bum. It's a sad reality that he could rule the world, but he couldn't control, couldn't rule himself. So there's the third of the kingdom. So after his death, his empire now became much weaker, and it was split into parts. And it was then overthrown on June 22 of 168 B.C., but remember, the dream predicted four earthly empires. So we've had the first one of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, now this fourth empire. Here's how Daniel describes the final empire to the king. He says, and a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And I think all of you know what kingdom that was. The kingdom of Rome. Rome rolled over an, over an even greater territory. And with iron fist brutality, the nation or the, the Roman Empire still has the reputation of being one of the most brutal. What's another word that comes to my mind? Barbaric. Thank you. That was what I was thinking about there, Renee. They ruled their empire with an iron fist. But from this point on, no single empire would follow Rome to rule the entire world. Because then the rest of the prophecy goes on to say, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and as you saw iron mixed with a ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to it one to another, just as iron does not mix with clay. That's in Daniel 2 also. Well, the reality is, through luxury and political corruption, moral decay, Rome lost its stability and its strength. 
and it became easy prey for barbaric tribes to come in and conquer. These tribes began to invade Rome, that Roman Empire, between 351 AD and 476 AD. So Rome controlled the world for about 125 years. I'm sorry. AD and uh, AD, BC and AD. I, I'm, I'm quoting some wrong, wrong dates there. But the fact is, is that Rome, the nations that Rome uh, controlled, we look at those as being the nations of Europe today. That's pretty much the territory. There's historians, they all agree that these are the way the nations of the, uh, of, of the world were, were divided. But God's word said they will never cleave or they will never mingle with one another. There's a movie that was made during World War II. A presentation was made by a, by a Christian Bible scholar, and it actually made headlines in several of the newspapers because it basically quoted this passage that basically said, Hitler will never win. And then he quoted these Bible verses. Well, the reality is, even with the European market, with the common currency, it still stands as a divided territory in the world today. And we can, we can be confident, friends, in God's word. No attempt to put the Roman Empire back together will ever last, and it's been tried many, many times. We know the battle, I mean, Charlemagne, Charles the the fifth, Louis the fourteenth, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Adolf Hitler, all of them what have been defeated. They wanted to they wanted to bring Europe together. They wanted to unite Europe. It never happened. As God says, just as iron and clay cannot stick together, so these nations will never cleave one to another. Here's the reality. God's word was too much for all of these guys. God's word is more powerful. God said they shall not cleave one to another. Friends, God's word never fails. But now Daniel, he comes to the part of the, of the dream. This is the astounding climax of this dream that was also predicted. And in Daniel 2, verse 44, in the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Now, the reality of that passage is that when Daniel reads, or when, when, when Daniel tells the king, he says, just as you saw that a stone was cut from, from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So here's the king now. He sees that his kingdom is not going to last because it's going to be overthrown. And we don't have time to talk about the fact that the king became so heady and so cocky. This is when he decided to build, you know, erect this great golden image, head to toe gold. And this is where he had the, you know, all the, all the people of his, of his nation and the, and the Hebrews and, and those who had been captured uh, in, into his encampment. This is where they all... Uh, were forced to bow and worship. And he had got this big furnace going, heated it seven times hotter than it needed to be, and anyone who refused to bow to that image gets cast into the fiery furnace. And this is the great story we know of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and uh, instead of them three being in the furnace, there was, anyway, great, 
That's part of the book of Daniel. You have to read it all. We're not going to cover it all tonight. But the fact is that God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. And the king sat there and said, yep, what you have... What you have told me is exactly what I saw. So as the king was recognizing what Daniel showed him, what Daniel had seen in vision was, was exactly what he saw, then he's going to say to himself, that interpretation needs to be looked at as well. But he was such a headstrong, proud king that that's where he, he ignored God's interpretation, thought he could handle things on his own. But let's move on. That stone that shatters the other nations. I'm going to pause right here. Babylon came and went. Medo-Persia came and went. Greece came and went. Rome came and went. When Rome was divided, those Ten toes, those ten nations of, of the nation of, of Europe, they've never, the word is true, they will, they will not cleave one to another. That's where we are in this prophecy. We're in the toes of that, of that great prophecy. And the stone that comes and destroys that big image is the kingdom of Christ. It's Christ's kingdom. And just like all the other kingdoms of this dream, rose and fell, this prediction, my friends, praise God, this prediction will come true. The next great event in the stage of human history is the second coming of Jesus. I can't wait for that to happen. But again, you know, the Lord in his mercy, and we're going to be talking about this tomorrow night. He says, you know, I'm not just going to surprise you. Here are some signs. Here are some things that you need to look for before I return. So we're going to be covering that tomorrow night. So be sure you're here. But God, his kingdom will be established. His kingdom here will be on on this earth, and it's going to be called the New Jerusalem. This earth, put this in your mind. I mean, think of all the billions and billions of planets and galaxies out there. This earth is going to be the center of the universe. This is where God himself is going to call home. And the new Jerusalem, this is where it's going to be. Wow. So our rescue from pain and suffering reveals this true picture of God. When God, when Jesus comes again, we'll be talking about this through the rest of the week. Christ's kingdom will fill the whole earth. Revelation 11, I love this verse. 11, Revelation 11, 15 sums it up so well. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever. Oh, and he shall reign forever and ever. You know, right now, you may be thinking, well, the story of the kings, his dream, that's an incredible story. It's very interesting. But really, what does that have to do with me here, the new year of 2023? Well, my friends, it has everything to do with you and with me. Everything. You see, the prophecy that's located there in Daniel 2 that we just studied, proves that the Bible is is true and trustworthy. It is predicted that the entire world, the world that we know today, is a world that is teetering on the brink of eternity. Um, It predicted the entire world history in advance, in that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, And here's the reality. There is only one event left in that dream. Now, the question I ask for you is this. If all the events have already been fulfilled, that they've they've come true, and there's one 
left, what are the odds that that one's going to come true? I think we can stake our lives on it. And that's the glorious return, the glorious coming of Jesus Christ. All these others came to pass. This one will also. Though mountains can crumble, you can always count on every word of God. Though circumstances around you may fall, may be very, very difficult for you to deal with, you can trust in the word of God that his word will not fail you. The, the reality that Jesus will come and establish his eternal kingdom on this earth the beautiful part of that picture is that he wants every one of us here tonight to be a part of that beautiful tomorrow. He wants us part of that family. Maybe he's delaying because there's just a few more people that are kind of teetering. Friends, when you... I, I, I love this illustration, and I wish I could have found it because I would have... I'd have Recorded and showed on YouTube. But here's, here's a pastor friend of mine. Who has a bunch of kids standing on the stage. And they're holding a, a, a piece of twine. A piece of baling twine. I mean their church is huge. From one end of the, uh, of the wall. Way to the other end of the wall. And he got about every six inches. He's got a, a little ribbon. And every one of these little spans. Represents a hundred years. And there's hundreds of years. And then he gets to the very end here, and there's one little piece of thread. And he said, this represents your life. This represents the, 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 the time of your life. You know, just this little, little chunk of time at the end. He says, isn't it sad that most people focus all of their energies on acquiring stuff and happiness and and." And pursuing the things of this world in this little this little section of time. But then if you take this whole big, big piece of twine here, and if I ran this twine all the way across the state of Arizona, all the way to the state of New York, but the only part we're interested in is that little bit. I don't know about you, friends, but I think it's worth, I don't even call it a risk. It's worth the fact that I could put my trust in the word of God and know that I'm not just living in that little block of time. That Christ has promised eternity. And he's showing us in these prophecies. You see, the Bible is more than just accurate history or, or reliable stories. It's more than prophecies. It's more than prophecies fulfilled. It is a love letter. Amen. It's a love letter. It's a letter that's full of truth. And it's, it's a love there that, that's full of, of enduring word that has stood the test of time. Amen. The theme of the, the book, the theme of the Bible, is the account of that event that took place 2,000 years for us. And it occurred on a rugged hill just right outside of Jerusalem 20 centuries ago. And it makes a difference what we believe about that fact also. It's not just a historical document. The question is this. What is the greatest evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be? I will tell you, it's the power to change people's lives. I could, I could tell you all night stories about people that I've known, the before and after. I'm going to brag on my youngest son. He was a rascal as a kid growing up. And he became a dentist. And he lives just not too many miles from us in the Phoenix area. And he has shown me pictures of what he has done the before and after, you know, the, the goober, and now he's, he's, you know, Mr. America. You know, the, the, the guy with, with the teeth that are so rotten and, and a fake. 
And he's done these total restorations. And he's even got some videos of people, the first time they see themselves, they just start crying. Oh. That's just a temporary physical change on this earth. The changes that really, really touch my heart are the changes of people like my Uncle Pete. I won't give you his last name. It's a Ukrainian name. My Uncle Pete had the reputation of being a drunken bum. I mean, every night of the week, he was down at the bar, drinking, spending money that he should have spent on his kids for food and clothes. His kids and his family, they were paupers. And then Uncle Pete met Jesus. I can't even begin to tell you. When I first met him after he met Jesus, and he came and he hugged me, and he didn't have alcohol on his breath that could knock you over with, and, and, and he had this look of peace and joy, and, and he looked 50 years younger. And all he could say was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I'm going to pick on a friend of mine here. I, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to talk to my friend Jim over here. I've known Jim for 30 years. Just because a person claims they're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean they are, they are one. I mean, it's no more, I mean, just because... You know, you go into your garage, you claim you're a car? No. Just because you claim a, you're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean you are one. And many people go through this journey claiming to be Christians. They may know a lot about Jesus. They may know a lot about the Bible, but they don't know Jesus as their friend. And that's a lot of difference. And there's a lot of people that go around and they practice what I call ugly religion. Oh, they can beat you over the head with every Bible verse that they know. You know, they can speak, they can cry aloud and spare a lot and, and, and make you feel like the most worthless human being. But, you know, they have not sinned in the last six months. The power of the Lord and the Holy Spirit to take and transform a life, to me, is the greatest evidence that that book we've been talking about, the Bible, is everything it claims to be. Thank you, Jim. It's everything it claims to be. And I can almost assure you that there's people here sitting tonight that could come up and give a testimony of how God has made a difference in your life. I'm going to just share a little bit of my journey. I'm one of the lucky ones. I shouldn't say lucky. I'm one of the fortunate ones. I was born in a, in a Christian home. My parents and grandparents were very, very, I could use the word strict, conservative, Russian Mennonite Christians. My grandparents had immigrated from the Ukraine. Every morning and every night they knelt together as a family and they prayed and they read their Bible. Wonderful, wonderful people. Russians and Ukrainians, as you well know, they're very closely attached, but what's happening over there and I still can't understand. I, I can't put that together. But the point is this. In their culture, spending time with God in the morning and evening was very important. My mom and dad brought that into our home. I mean, I don't care how late it was at night. My mom and dad, before we went to bed, boys... We had no sisters, so it was boys. Boys, let's have prayer. So we'd gather around and, and we would pray. I'm going to have to have to admit that my son Jason, my youngest son Jason, the apple didn't fall very far from the tree. Because I was a rascal, and I admit it. I, um, my teenage and college years, can't, not real proud of some of the things I did. But then God in his mercy led me to someone, and I don't, we don't, I've never shared this in public. 
but I was an answer to a prayer. And here's how that answer happened. So here's Jody and his brother Lonnie and two other friends. The college I went to, we had we were part of what we called the Collegiate Christian League, where I was in a quartet. I sang second tenor, brother Lonnie sang baritone. We had a good sound. And we would go to high schools and private schools and churches and give programs. So here's goody two-shoes Jody up there, you know, this good little Christian boy, still doing stuff that I shouldn't. But I knew where my heart was, I knew what, I knew, and I knew what I wanted. So one of, the, one of the high school assemblies that we were invited to do was a private school there in, in La Sierra. And uh, we gave this program. The speaker we had was one of the most dynamic Speakers, he had a testimony of, of how Jesus rescued him from a life of misery. There was a sophomore sitting in the chapel who started to look at Jody, and Jody loves singing, and he's got a smile on his face. He must know Jesus. I'm dating guys that aren't real in love with Jesus. So that night she went home and she said, Lord, you know where my heart is and I want to follow you. But I need someone to be strong with me. I need someone to walk with me that has a, has a strong spiritual heart. Lord, help me to find somebody like Jody Meloshenko. You know who made that prayer? My dear wife right here. But it was two years later that we even met. And she had prayed that prayer. Now friends, I don't tell you that just, but can you imagine what that does? She never told me this prayer until after we had been married several years. That God, that I'm an answer to somebody's prayer. You see, the power of prayer and the power of God implanting in our hearts something that the world cannot understand. Something that will last through eternity. The Bible is called the living word. It reveals the true heart of God to everyone who seeks and searches through its pages. It carries amazing power wherever it goes power that changes lives, transforms character. So the 52 years that my dear wife and I have been together, our three children, our five grandkids, what's number one in my, in my journey at this stage of life? I want to spend eternity with my family. I want my kids. I want my grandkids. I want my brothers. I want my family with me. And only through prayer and through study in the Word of God can that transform lives. So as we close, how can this make a difference in my life? Friends, seek the Lord in its pages with an open mind and an open heart and it will transform you. As you discover the true heart of God. It'll give you strength during your times of weakness. It'll give you courage when you're depressed. It'll be, give hope to the, to the dying. The power of the Bible to change people has been proven over and over throughout the history of mankind. I know of people who've had violent tempers who've been changed to peaceful people lustful, immoral, impure, vile people who have become pure and clean. They haven't been through any, you know, detox program through the Word of God. My Uncle Pete, a drunkard, delivered from those chains of drinking. Thieves, 
delivered from their stealing, cheaters from their cheating. The lives of hardened criminals have been changed. There's just so many examples of criminals that have found Jesus behind bars and how it's changed their lives. If you've ever heard of the, uh, the story of Nicky Cruz, the gangster, druggie in New York City, changed into rejoicing Christians through God's word, through, through the power of, of prayer. Friends, the reality is you cannot read the Bible faithfully without God doing something to change you forever. It, it's, it's a formula. It's a recipe. I'm not a cook. A few recipes that I've tried and up for discussion. But I can guarantee you that the recipe that God guarantees that will change your life is faithfully studying his word and keeping your heart and your mind open to how his spirit will change you. God's word can only change those, though, who are willing to be changed. See, my friend, it really makes a difference what we do with that book. It's more than a, just a book to carry to church. It's more than a, a dust collector there in one of your bookshelves. It's more than helpful information or useful, as, useful advice. And as, I, and as I said a minute ago, it's more than, than a hammer to use to clobber people. It is God's word. It is God speaking to our hearts. And it reveals the heart of God and a future and a hope for us. My question to you tonight is this. Will you allow God's word to change your life? I challenge you, if it start off, I mean, you say, hey, this is not part of my re routine. Take 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of each day to read the Bible. And, and as I shared yesterday, I encourage you to start with, a, with, with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're giving free of charge to everybody here tonight. If you, if you don't have the book Desire of Ages, it's one of the greatest volumes ever written on the life of Christ. And every chapter of that book has references where you can read the scripture that goes with that chapter. And it's just, it's, it's wonderful. The Holy Spirit inspired those writers to write these eternal truths. And this same spirit is the one who changes our hearts, who transforms our lives as we study it. The thing that I love about the gospel, and Jesus made it so plain, it doesn't matter where you've been, what road you've traveled, what you have done that is, what you think in your heart may be unforgivable. In spite of all that, he's made room for you at the cross. And I shared this illustration yesterday, and I'm going to share it again. I wish I could quote where I, where I read it, where I saw it, but I just love, I love the, the picture of the thief of the cross who dies, that cruel death. In that great resurrection morning, that thief who God, Jesus, told him, I say unto you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That thief's very first conscious reality is going to be with all of God's people who've been called in the second coming to heaven. And he and he's enters into the gates of that holy city and and, and he's looking around and and he's still in his bloody thief garb we think. And, and somebody comes up and says, um, how did you get here? How did you get here? The man in the middle invited me. 
the man in the middle invited me. The man in the middle invited me, my friends. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to accept his offer. And tonight, I just as we close, the most important decision that you and I can make is, is not the new house that we're going to be buying or the new car or the new boat or the new flat screen high definition television or the new Game Boy or whatever. But the most important decision we can make is a decision about accepting and believing God's unchanging, holy word that he's given for us to read and to come to an understanding that it is true and that we open our hearts and say, Lord, I may not understand this. Yeah, this is maybe new to me, but Lord, I'm willing. Use me. Change me. Philippians 1, 1 chapter 1, 6 says that it's incredible. I claim this this, this promise for my kids and my grandkids. Anybody know what the text I'm talking about? That he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. So here's my prayer for you tonight. All you need to say, God, I give you permission to complete that work in my life. I just give you permission to do that. However long it takes and whatever avenues and because as we know the character of God, the heart of God as we've discovered in these first years, God is not a God that's going to force his will on anybody. He needs permission to do something alive with your grandkids or your children or that wayward friend of yours. So you pray to God and now God can look at the enemy and say, I have permission. I have permission. I want us to each one of us tonight, if it, if it is your prayer that you want to make a commitment here at the beginning of this year, that you want to take time intentionally to get to know Jesus in a much better way through your word, I want you to raise your hand and say with me, I want to know about your word, what it teaches about the heart of God. I, I want to know you better, Lord. I see every hand raised. Lord, I just want to say thank you. We are sojourners in this planet called Earth. And some of us have lost our way. But Lord, you have looked at us and you've said, hey, here I am. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Follow me. Amen. Lord, all of us with our hands raised tonight, we give you permission to enter in our hearts and change us. We want to be more like Jesus. We want the world to look at us and say, you know, I like what I'm seeing in that person. I need to know what they know because I want to know it too. So, Father, thank you for blessing us here with your presence. We just look forward to being together again tomorrow night. We love you, Lord, is our prayer in your name. Amen.